City University Television presents the American Theatre Wing Seminars. Working in the theater. This seminar, Critics. Hello, I'm Doug Leeds, President of the American Theatre Wing, and we'd like to welcome you to another one of the Wing's many Working in the Theatre seminars. Today, we're focusing on the subject of theatre critics. Later in this program, we'll tell you more about the many educational programs of the Wing, but right now, let's join our very distinguished panel and our moderator, Howard Sherman, Executive Director of the American Theatre Wing. The theater critic is an inextricable and indeed inevitable part of the process of theater in any community in which it's made. But while we always have the opportunity to read what a critic thinks about a particular production or a series of productions, we really don't have the opportunity to know the people behind those opinions. Over the course of the next 90 minutes, we want to take the opportunity to understand more about the role of the theater critic from the critics themselves how they do what they do, why they do what they do, and hopefully give everyone some more insight into these people who are so much a part of the theater process. I'd like to introduce our panel for today, beginning on my right, Michael Koshwara of the Associated Press, Melissa Rose Bernardo of Entertainment Weekly, Jeremy McCarter from New York Magazine, Alyssa Gardner from USA Today, and Michael Feingold, from the Village Voice. With the goal of understanding more about who these people are, I want to start with a question for the whole panel. And very simply, tell us what was the first time you recall going to the theater and absolutely being blown away and excited and that stuck in your brain as, as your first great time at the theater. And I'm going to start again on my right with Mike. Uh, well, my first really memorable theater experience was at the Pocono Playhouse, uh, a long, long forgotten comedy called The Third Best Sport, which I think came to Broadway and died in about two weeks, but it starred Celeste Holm. As a little kid of about eight years old, this was a, it was a sex comedy, so there was, it was, I thought it was pretty racy, uh, though at the time, if I probably read it now, I think it would be probably pretty PG rated. But I remember in the second act, Celeste Holm had to get, play the character who got drunk, and I was totally exhilarated. I was shocked. I said, my gosh, and everybody was laughing hysterically, and it excited me. I thought, my gosh, she's getting a reaction from this audience, and uh, from that, I, of course, I had to go backstage and get her autograph afterwards, and from then on, I was hooked. Melissa? Well, my story is not nearly as star-driven. <laughs> I have a sort of vague memory of being about 10 and going to the Fisher Theater in Detroit to see Annie with my mom and my grandma and that was growing up where I saw all sorts of touring shows and but I just I have this distinct memory of Annie and hating Miss Hannigan and <laughs> wanting to be friends with all the orphans and I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> Jeremy? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I've been thinking about this, and I don't think I, I don't think I have one single bolt from the blue moment of sitting in the audience anyway, and finding and you know being captivated by the theater and feeling like this is you know something I need to be more a part of. When I was a kid and in school, I was always in plays uh, or working on plays in one capacity or another, and. I think that maybe had more to do with hooking me on it than sitting in the audience. Uh, and, and, uh, and funny enough, there was something I read, in fact, something that was written about the theater that is the closest I can remember to having a moment where I thought, this, this is amazing and wonderful, and I, I, need, to, I need to explore this. Uh, it was something that Robert Brustein wrote about 10 years ago. It was a review of The Lion King, actually, which is not where you'd think necessarily there'd be a kind of, you know, epiphany uh, of, of the dramatic arts, uh, but, but there was. And uh, Brustein made the point that the, what every theater tradition in the world has historically understood, uh, with the exception of, of ours, of the Western tradition, 
is that the secret of theater is not to make an audience forget that they're watching a play, it's to constantly remind them that they're watching a play. And I still, I guess, can't quite explain why I find that so compelling, but I do. Uh, and, and it's still the most exciting thing about the theater to me, is that, is that sense of sort of knowing that someone's playing a trick on you and loving every minute of it. Melissa? Well, um, I was in plays in school as well, mostly musicals. Uh, I was a singer who moved, <laughs> I think is how <laughs> actors refer to it. And um, my parents, like a lot of kids growing up in suburban New York, my parents uh, would take my brother and, and me into New York City all the time to see Broadway musicals. And uh, my earliest and fondest memories include seeing Christine Andreas in Oklahoma. I think Christine Ebersole was also in that production as Ada Annie. Um, and also seeing a revival of West Side Story with Debbie Allen as Anita, and I think Jossie de Guzman as Maria. So um, that, I mean, you know, Rodgers and Hammerstein and Bernstein and Sondheim, not a bad way to start. <laughs> Michael? I feel very old because I re I've reviewed most of the things these other people <laughs> mentioned. Um, to show you, this is going to date me, but my parents went to the theater a lot. I grew up in Chicago, and the transforming experience, I remember, is being taken at age eight to a review called New Faces, which my mother mistakenly thought was something suitable for children. It was, in fact, a very sophisticated New York review on its, one of its performers had become a very big star and on its national tour, knowing that the folks outside New York like, they threw out all the sophisticated material and replaced it with numbers for her, and her name was Eartha Kitt. Uh, and one of the numbers in the second act was her big Turkish belly dance number, Uskadara. My parents were appalled. I was fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> now, already there have been mentions of people appearing in high school shows and so on. Um, Michael, you famously continue to not only work as a critic, but you work within the field as well as a translator, primarily of, of German material uh, well, for the stage. <laughs> everyone says German. Yeah, I, I, um, I that's actually my conjoined twin brother who uh -huh. has the same name. We don't talk <laughs> about him when we're talking about criticism. But yes, I have a, a second life in the theater, um, so which is, conflicts. Is the, do, well, you said it. Does it conflict? Sure. How do you balance being a theater practitioner and working and collaborating with artists who, at other times, you may have been put in the position of writing about and judging their work? Um, always tell the truth and don't let your malice run away from you, and then you're safe in most situations. Have other people faced that? Jeremy, you also yeah, have uh, done you some work. You work in the theater. Yeah, it, uh, it comes up sometimes. It's, um, uh, it's, it's something to be aware of. It can be dicey sometimes. Um, there are some companies that I don't write about because I feel that I'm too close to the people in them for you know, personal reasons or professional reasons. Uh, and, uh, but, but I do think that the larger issue is that I think while it can be complicated sometimes, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, feeling that you can be fair and take a shot at someone or praise someone. I think that there's a tradition in the theater that many of the very best critics mm. have done both, and sometimes done both simultaneously. Shaw and Max Bierbaum, George S. Kaufman, uh, Bob Brustein. Uh, uh, that's the company to keep. I think it's, it's the way... I find that the two inform one another in a way that makes both more satisfying. Have, Alyssa, have you ever experienced that, or was it really you took a break from your performing and then moved into Oh, writing? yeah, it was something I did in high school and college, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I loved it. And I didn't write for the newspaper in, in high school or college, but um, I think it gave me an appreciation for what performers go through, um, even physically, you know, I mean, how, how rigorous it is. And uh, my mom was also a professional singer, so she imparted that to me. The conflict I face now more than that is that I'm also a reporter as well as a critic. So often I'll be interviewing somebody before or after I see the show. And I think what you have to do is basically, you know, 
separate the art from the artist, which is always a good rule to follow <laughs> anyway in general. So, Melissa, Mike, were either of you ever performers or moved to be performers? Oh, I, I did it in high school, <laughs> I think, and, uh, and never really thought seriously about doing it. Uh, I, I do have some friends who are performers who I know from college just from writing about them, became friendly with them later. So there are some situations where like, I wouldn't review a show that they're in. Not that they're good friends, but sort of acquaintances. And I feel the, the need just to kind of back off. But like Elisa, I report as well. And, uh, and I'm the one who sort of determines what we write about. So it can be you know, sometimes you do, like she said, have to kind of step back and make that separation. That's, I have the same problem, too, because I also do feature stories on people. And it's usually, if it's a performance that I like, then I'll interview the person. It's hard when the, before the show opens to actually interview someone. And then you see the show, and you don't like the show, or you don't like the performance. And then you have to put, separate the critic from the reporter. and just give an honest answer to what you feel is on stage. I think that gets a bit to something maybe we can talk about, which is that this is in some ways an incredibly perverse job that we have, <laughs> yeah. where our, we make our living telling people that they've done something right or that they've done something wrong. And there, there's certainly a lot more to it than that. Uh, but the theater community in New York is pretty small. I mean, we all know lots of people that we have to write about all the time. Uh, so the, it, it turns out I think the, the working in the theater while writing about the theater is not even at the top of the list of the things that make it complicated. I have a, a friend, uh, a diplomat, in fact, uh, who, who says, um, life is messy. Um, and I think in the New York theater, uh, that is certainly the case. And a lot of actors say they don't read reviews, but I, I don't believe them. Uh, you know, yeah, I, 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 I think I think they Ross said a thing about that. He said when when an actor tells me he never reads my reviews, I always know he has the Saturday Review rolled up in his back pocket. <laughs> okay. yeah. Yeah. Well, in this small community, you have to ask: Have you ever been confronted by people who you've given a negative review to? You have. Oh, I, constantly. <laughs> Jimmy, throw to Michael. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember if, any more specific incidents that you're thinking of. Uh, any? Was I don't, the Joe Papp story? Oh, that I have. T I have dozens of Joe Papp stories. They Let's take keep it too, too long. long to tell. <laughs> well, it, it, well, it's, well, it's a two-part story. Um, I went to the opening of some play that Papp was hoping to uh, move uptown from the public theater. And he was there standing with the press rep as I got my tickets. And I said, hello, Joe. And he said, oh, here to write one of your condescending intellectual reviews, eh? And I said, I'll do my best, and <laughs> went into the theater. And then two days later, I got a call inviting me to see another show that was being opened on very short notice in one of the smaller upstairs theaters at the public. And I got there and found that not a lot of the press had been invited. And Joe was there with the press rep and pulled me aside. And he said, I didn't ask all of them to this, but I ask you because you're the one who will understand. This is really a Joe Papp story and not a criticism story. That is, our, people deal with their idea of you as a critic rather than with what you actually are. And this is one of, one of the things you learn in criticism, I think, is to look at the thing for what it actually is. That's always the challenge. What did I see? What did I hear? What is it about? What am I going to say about it? What did it do to me? Well, you, you, make, you used an interesting phrase in there that I want to pursue, which is you say, you know, it's something you have to learn about being a critic. Uh -huh. How do you learn to be a critic? Melissa, how did you start? I started writing reviews in college and just thought, well, you know, I did plays in high school. I know a little about theater. I've seen some theater. I could write about it. <laughs> and, but why and did you start writing reviews? You see, that's interesting. That was really sort of the only, well, at least how it was set up at my college paper. I went to University of Michigan. We had sort of, you could write a preview or you could write a review. And sometimes you did both. So you would sort of preview the production. So you would interview someone involved with the production, the director or something. Then you would go review it, which could be a little weird. And now, of course, you realize that that's completely weird. And a lot of times you wouldn't want to do that. But I just started writing as much as I could, and then started reading as much as I could, and studying as much as I could. I was lucky enough to go to a school where I could sort of pick and choose classes. So I picked 
classes about plays, mm. you know, dr American drama, modern drama, Shakespeare, you know, three Shakespeare classes in one year. I mean, just to get that, I was lucky enough to be <coughs> able to sort of study as much as I can and then just see as much as I can. I feel like I'm still learning to be a critic and I feel like I can't be a good critic unless I see everything I possibly can. It's tricky and time consuming. <laughs> Melissa, learning to be yeah, a critic? Uh, well, I wrote about pop music primarily, in fact, almost exclusively for years before I was hired to write about theater and pop music at USA Today. I've got, in addition to being a reporter and a critic, I also have these two beats. It's weird. I can write about American Idol and August Strindberg in the same day. And it's interesting because your predecessor, <laughs> your main predecessor, David Patrick Stearns, emphasized he was did theater and classical music. Exactly, yeah. So, and um, I think they wanted a little more popular coverage, popular music coverage. And, you know, David's a great writer, and, uh, and he was incredibly supportive of me early on. And um, so they basically, you know, similar thing where I didn't write critically about uh, drama previously at all to getting that job, but I had um, in college, uh, I'd been an English major, and theater had actually been my concentration within my major. So in addition to doing plays, I you know, took classes, I TA'd a class in Ibsen and Shaw, you know, things like that. But I, I still feel very much that I'm, I'm learning. And I have to say one thing, having written about pop music and theater, that by and large I find theater critics know, <laughs> I maybe I'll get into trouble for saying this, but they seem to know a lot more about theater as, as a whole than music, pop music critics do about pop music, <laughs> about the history of music in general. You know, there, there is, I find theater critics are by and large very well informed, very passionate about the art they write about as opposed to just the idea of theater, if that makes any sense. It makes sense to me. Yeah. I, th I think you have to be, the worst part and the most exciting part of being a critic is that you absolutely never know what will be thrown at you the next night, so you have to be ready for it. You have to know what kind of play this is and what this is about and why they do it this way rather than that way and what you think of that and how it relates to what's going on outside the theater. It's an endless learning process. I've, I've been at it for 30, I don't even want to think, years, <laughs> and I'm still learning. I learn every day. And let me ask all of you, is this what you wanted to be when you grew up? Is this, was this the goal, or is this some place you found yourself? Mike? I have to admit, this is what I wanted to do, which is scary uh, for a 12-year-old kid who used to subscribe to Variety and would clip reviews uh, from the local paper. In fact, in the small town in Maryland where I grew up, they, the local newsstand got one copy of Variety every week, and they would save it for me. And, once my mother went down to buy it because I was sick and they wouldn't give it to her. <laughs> she didn't have ID? No, uh, she said, we're saving it for this little kid that comes in every Friday and you can't have it. But it is something that you know, I've always been interested in. And getting back to this, how did, you, you know, how did you have this desire? I think you have to gorge yourself on theater. Before I had this job, I used to max out my credit cards buying theater tickets, which was pretty scary. And that's when theater tickets were relatively cheap. Uh, you just have to see as much as possible, and every time I go, it's you know it's a new experience. I always the most exciting moment in any show is right when the curtain, the curtain is just about to go up, the lights go down, and you never know what you're going to get. I mean, it could be wonderful, it could be terrible, but it's that thrill of anticipation that I can keep you going. So, um, Melissa, is this? what you want, is this the writing you want to be doing? Yeah, it, it is actually, and it's funny because I, I do other kinds of writing, I do book reviews, I do some DVD reviews, but uh, mostly, you know, and some CD stuff, although a lot of that's theater music, but this was all I ever wanted to do, and it's, it's hard because it's kind of limiting, I mean, there aren't that many outlets or chances, but I used to, uh, I used to read Theater Week, does everyone remember mm. Theater Week? And there was one newsstand in Ann Arbor that got it. <laughs> Sometimes they wouldn't get it or they'd get it late and I, I would go every week and read and that was my sort of pipeline to what was going on in New York because when you're in the Midwest you figure you know you're in the middle of nowhere 
sorry, that was how it felt sometimes. And, you know, I had to know what was going on in New York at all times. And yeah, when I was here interning, doing a bunch of unpaid internships one summer, I would just go to the theater constantly. And mm -hmm. it's expensive. Even on the half price line, it's expensive. <laughs> Jeremy? Uh, I still want to be an astronaut when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> so, How's that going? Uh, you're lucky. I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> right. Um, uh, no, I, I, it, it certainly wasn't something that I was lying awake at night dreaming about when I was 12. The astronaut was what I was dreaming about. Uh, it was in, at some point in college, I had been writing for my school's newspaper, and I'd been um, working on shows a lot, directing and doing some other things, and um, was trying to figure out what I could do that would be satisfying and fulfilling and challenging and all those good things. Uh, uh, and allow me to eat. Uh, and I didn't know how to do, I didn't know how to get started, I didn't know what I was going to do, and had the good fortune to encounter a mentor who, who showed me the way, and that, that was Bob Brewstein. And uh, I guess the, he, uh, Bob at, at that point was the artistic director of the American Repertory Theater, which he had founded. He was, uh, was and still is the drama critic for the New Republic, uh, and very active uh, as a writer and a director of individual plays. And, um, and when I was 19 or 20, that job description sounded perfect to me. That sounded like heaven. Uh, and, you know, a bit later, it's still satisfying and challenging and all the things I was hoping that it would be uh, when I was in school. I don't think I had a, a conscious ambition to be a critic um, or even a reporter or... I know that I, I loved to write, and I loved music, and I loved theater, so I wanted to do something that would involve one of those things, and the fact that I'm kind of, you know, getting to draw on my love for all those things now is, is wonderful. I, it really doesn't feel like a job to me anymore, or it never did, really. I mean, at this point, it still doesn't, is what I should say. It, it doesn't feel like a job at 9 a.m. when you're staring at the blank computer screen and the pieces due at noon. It um, does for me. Well, maybe our yeah. deadlines are a little no, more but you know, flexible. You know what I mean. I know what you mean, yeah. It, it feels like a job most when, um, when I see something that just doesn't really strike me either way. When I love something, it's fun to write. When I really hate something, it's, it's kind of fun. I have to be careful not to be too mean. But mm. uh, when, it's, when, I just, when I see something that just kind of leaves me cold or leaves me uninspired, that, that's when it feels like a job. And by that, I don't mean that I don't like it. I just mean that I, it, doesn't particularly move, it doesn't particularly move me to say anything. That's, that's when it feels like a job, yeah. Do you all have a harder time writing about things you really like or things that you don't Sometimes. like? Sometimes. Sometimes, when it's an artist in music or theater, if it's an artist that I'm very passionate about, um, early on in my career, I would second guess myself. I would say, I can't write a Valentine to this person. I have to be careful. I've got to. But I think what I've, what I'm learning to do, and I'm still learning, is uh, to trust my instincts. I think that you know, appreciation of of art is about. Um, it is a visceral reaction, you know. I mean, it's when something moves you that, and you can express that in some way without over-intellectualizing it. You know, I think the best art does that. Mm -hmm. It affects you emotionally. That's why it's hard to write about. I want to shift a little to some of the practical issues. And first of all, I want to give some perspective for everyone about your audience. Um, Mike, you write for the Associated Press. It's a name we all know, but can you just explain very briefly what the AP is and how your writing reaches an audience? Uh, well, the AP, believe it or not, is a nonprofit organization. It's a, what they call a wire service, and we are owned by all its subscribers, which include newspapers, radio stations, television. So we send our stuff out over the wire, and it goes on you know, various different wires, and they can do whatever they want with it, including my reviews. They can cut it, they could run the whole thing, but it has an enormous reach. Just in the states alone, I think we have about 
1,700, 1,800 newspapers. So it goes out all over the place. But we're never quite sure what it looks like when it comes out at the other end, which, really fascinating. which is kind of scary. I've seen my reviews cut to two paragraphs. Yeah. Uh, so in that respect, I better say what I think of the show in the first you know, two or three paragraphs, or people are not going to know what I thought. So it does sort of limit your style. Uh, but although things have been changing now with the internet, you know, everything, even the AP is changing with newspapers changing. It's a whole different world. And gosh, I, I don't know what newspapers are going to be like in the next five to ten years. It's, it, a lot will disappear or they'll just change the way, you know, they present news. So the AP uh, goes to all these papers. And I'm writing for an audience that may never see the shows that, you know, I'm writing about. So it has to be fairly explanatory. Uh, they may not even have heard of a lot of these people. They'll never, usually they might have, you know, go to Broadway, but off-Broadway shows, which I still like to write about just to keep, you know, people informed. Um, so it has to be fairly, I don't want to say simplistic, but I really have to uh, give them the basics. So from the AP, mm -hmm. which goes out and we don't know where it ends up, I want to talk about USA Today because in point of fact, you are the theater critic of the largest newspaper in America which a lot of people don't realize. Yeah, it's, um, God, when you put it that way. <laughs> You're really it, important. It uh, sounds, makes me feel a lot of responsibility. But, um, yeah, we, I think we have a circulation of 2.3 million, and, and uh, the Internet, also we have an Internet arm that we're very actively involved now in working together and developing it further because that is the future, and I think our editors have the foresight to see that, although we all, I certainly have, you know, I think we all have mixed feelings about the internet, but it's, it's here and it's not going anywhere. Um, but yeah, it, it's a general, I hate the term general audience, but it's a, um, it's, a, it's a mass audience and because of that I don't, I have to be very careful about what I, what I can see. I can't see everything. And I'm the only theater critic <coughs> reporter at the paper. Um, I cover all Broadway shows. I cover as much off-Broadway and major regional as I can, but that's not a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, my editors, to their credit, are very, uh, they, they love theater. They encourage me to do as much as I can. And what I've been doing recently is uh, columns where I can at least spotlight regional shows, including ones that I can't travel to see, and off-Broadway shows, as opposed to, you know, if we don't have space to write an entire separate review, at least this way we get to mention. Uh, but we don't cover off-off-Broadway. We don't really cover any fringe-type stuff. Um, you know, we, we have to uh, deal with the space we have and use it, hopefully, as, as well as we can. So for you and Mike, I want to ask, you are both, you said, general interests. Yes. You are clearly serving uh, the broadest possible audience in your cases. Do you have directives from your media editors or at your, your outlets that say the kind of, say what you should or shouldn't write or what you should or shouldn't? No, I, I've never think? had any restriction put on me, although uh, they certainly uh, would like a story on someone who's a, a name that people would recognize. If you can interview a Julie Andrews or a uh, uh, Julia Roberts or Denzel <laughs> Rock, uh, Washington, yep. that's the, a name that people would recognize. That's, that. about, that's about a feature story. Yes, that's a feature story. The question is, as a critic, do you, well, for, let's use an example. Do you have the opportunity, if you see some really phenomenal show, say, down at the Flea Theater, and not, we won't use Mrs. Farnsworth when it would yes. go in Sigourney Weaver, yes. but you go see some really, really interesting piece at the Flea. Do you have the opportunity, I use the Flea because it's a very small space, it's off, off Broadway, most of the time not stars, can you get that into your publications? Yes. Yes, yes because uh, of column form. Uh, I, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily get space, you know, half a page for it, but uh, we do get to, um, yeah, and my editors give me total autonomy as well, and the head of the Life Section's a big theater fan, you know, she'll go to London and ask me what to see, so um, they, they're interested also in my keeping up on what's going on in London and in other places, so, you know, they really try to do as much as, as they can and, and assume that you know, try to assume that the general audience is not just interested in Broadway, even though, in all fairness, that is our focus. 
Now, I want to turn to Entertainment Weekly because there's a very interesting thing about Entertainment Weekly. When that magazine began, they actually had a stated policy that they weren't going to cover theater. And it was only after it had been going for a while. I was a press agent. Okay. We all looked at that magazine when it came out and said, how do we get coverage? And we were told, no, I'm sorry, we don't cover theater. And it's evolved over time. What is the sentiment now? And what, what opportunity do you have? You're not writing every week. And the reviews are all usually a single column of probably a few hundred words. Yeah, they, they really, they are short. Um, I, I haven't been at EW for 15 years, so that's funny. Anyway, I'll have to get to the bottom of that. But uh, when, I, when I got there, and that's how it pretty much is now, six years later, it's a case of you cover theater when there's an occasion, meaning there's a big Broadway show with a recognizable star. That's your lead review. And then you can sort of review a bunch of other smaller things. And my general guideline is, I try to review everything on Broadway. It's not always timely. Sometimes it'll be a few weeks after something opens. I very rarely skip a Broadway show. Um, but we have a, a lead review that's, you know, I'm trying to think, like, the next thing we'll probably do is Pajama Game. Harry Connick Jr., big star. You can slap a big picture of him. People might stop and read it because they recognize him. And then they might read the other stuff. That's kind of the idea. The other reviews are about this big 100 words. <laughs> which is <laughs> practically nothing. Uh, we do off-Broadway, but in general, it's, is it a, you know, an important playwright, a star? I mean, a star is obviously always the biggest thing, but, you know, if there's not a star in the latest John Patrick Shanley play, we're not going to skip it. Well, it's interesting because EW is looked at as certainly one of the great arbiters of broad-based pop culture in America. And so coverage within Entertainment Weekly certainly flies the flag of theater as still being part of pop culture. And there are plenty who would argue that theater hasn't been part of the broad popular culture in the way that Lost or Desperate Housewives might be now in a really long time. Do you also have the opportunity in some of those other outlets within Entertainment Weekly, you know, the, the hot list and things like that, do you have a voice yeah. in how do you insert theater alongside those other things? I, I just try to be loud and obnoxious sometimes. <laughs> but yes, when we don't have a section, and we haven't had one since, you know, we had one in the year-end issue, sort of a top 10, best, worst kind of thing. And we won't have one until probably late February. So sort of in the meantime, when we pick the must list every week, which is, you know, 10 things to hear, read, see, do, I can say, OK, the new Horton Foot play is really great. and. To a certain extent, no one argues because no one else has seen it. <laughs> so uh, a lot of times people are just believing me and saying, OK. And so that's one way to get things on, um, to get things coverage. Something else we're going to start doing is more internet stuff, like everyone else, just to get more stuff, to be able to be more timely, to be able to get stuff that may only have a three-week run, some kind of coverage. But then there are also other ways uh, in, sometimes in other sections, um, you know, theater-related DVDs, like the Broadway The American Musical DVD. You know, we got like 200 words in about that, I mean, which is pretty big. So, so here and there, there are other ways to do it. But, but you kind of have to find the avenues to, yeah, to get the critical voice out within the publication. We should say Entertainment yeah. Weekly has a weekly paid circulation of about 1.7 million, I believe which makes it certainly one of the top 50 magazines in the country. It's, it's got a broad reach. Yeah, so, so it can be difficult. And as far as planning coverage, we, do, we try not to be too sort of New York-centric, although that can be hard. But, but one of our tasks is to really try to do, I, when there's stuff in LA, we try to do LA stuff. We try to do Vegas stuff. We're obviously going to cover the Lord of the Rings musical in Toronto. Um, we've done London wrap-ups. We're going to try to do more regional stuff if there's just to because we know we have a national readership and you're pretty much thinking about the average person interested in theater maybe they'll come to New York see some shows and we want to tell them what's worth seeing and what's not but we also want to try as much as we can as often as we can to give a sense of what's going on outside of New York too 
Now let me turn to the two fairly quintessentially New York publications, because you have the Village Voice, which is you know, been since the 1950s, you know, originally thought of as the voice of Greenwich Village and the Bohemian <laughs> scene, and when of there course was it's one. changed. It's changed over so so it much really time. It has gone through multiple ownerships and so on and so forth. Um, Michael, again, are you given any direction about what you can and can't cover, or what you should or shouldn't say? Not. I don't think there's a can or can't. In it. it, what I cover is is what I think is most interesting. But I do this with one eye on what will get readership for the paper or for the website. Mm -hmm. But you're not the theater editor, correct? No. There is a theater editor because some people are saying they're kind the, of the singular the critic, voice yeah. for you. You have someone. But that this you... is because the voice has always had a very wide the range of theater coverage. There was a period when when there were six regular critics each contributing a full column in the late 70s. And um, the, the idea of having one, one lead critic is, is fairly late in, in the voice's history. Mm -hmm. And I think, in a, in a way, my readership has changed so much over the years. When I started there in the early 70s, the readership was people who lived in the village and people who wanted to think like people who lived in the village. You know, it was, it was national, but very small. Uh, then when we went on to free circulation, it, the, the circulation went up enormously, and the ad pages increased enormously. And I got a readership that I think was restricted to people specifically interested in the theater, but it was a much bigger one. And I suddenly found my reviews being talked about in a lot of areas of New York where they hadn't been before. And then the internet came in and the whole thing exploded in a weird way. Now I'm convinced that nobody actually reads me and I get very few web hits, but this is just my paranoia because I keep finding out people come to me and say, oh, you know, I read your article on such and such. Um, and I say, you did? <laughs> you know, like that. But now I don't, I don't know who they are. I just know there's a lot of them out there in the virtual mystery. And Jeremy, New York Magazine, about 450,000 paid uh, circulation each okay. week. Um, you are new to the magazine. You've been there not yet a year. Right, about six months. Um, what, were you, since you were hired so recently, we can ask, yeah. were there directives that you were given or was it simply we like what you've been saying in other publications. We'd like that voice in our publication. Well, I think the, the, what, what they're after. It, I, I'm lucky in the sense that my editors, the culture editors and the editor-in-chief, are, are very serious theater people. I mean, they, they love the theater. They go to see plays. They have opinions about it. And they want to see, uh, they want to see the theater given a lot of space and a lot of love in, in the pages, which is great for me. Uh, they don't. I think they, the 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 impulse is not to do conventional reviews much. Uh, the acting was nice. The writing was okay. The set was pretty. They want something a bit broader focus. They want something that would either, either be more thoughtful, more specific to one aspect of a production, something like that, uh, which which is liberating in a sense. It's nice to not feel that you need to have an opinion about the lighting design, for instance, <laughs> or that you can spend 700 words talking about one aspect of something. Uh, so, so that I mean that that was a guide. It was it was I, it was guidance that was liberating in the end. Uh, and in terms of the breadth of the coverage, what we end up covering, um, Broadway almost always will be covered. Uh, interesting off Broadway stuff will usually get covered. What I found is that I don't generally cover things that are happening downtown unless they're really good. If there's something really exciting happening south of 14th Street, I try to get there. Otherwise, it's just the nature of the magazine. There isn't that much space. Uh, it's funny. I wanted to say before, Howard, that ours is sort of the opposite of that. There was a period when the schedule was very hectic when my reviews of Broadway musicals, which have the widest readership, were posted web only. And we were using the space in the hard copy for the off-Broadway plays and the downtown pieces, which belong to the Voices hard copy readership. So it's exactly the opposite of what Jeremy is working but I, with. I, 
I bet there's a quali- the, the readerships share uh, the quality of being pretty avid theater goers. There was a, they did a study of, of the readers of New York Magazine, a couple of them recently, and anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of the people that they asked had seen a play in the last yeah. 12 months, which is a pretty extraordinary number. All things considered, it must be about the same for The Voice, I expect. I'm not so sure because The Voice has a big rock and pop music following and it has a big political following among people who aren't necessarily theater committed. Well, we're going to take a very brief break right now from the discussion and hear a few more words about the work of the American Theater Wing. The American Theater Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. We stand for excellence and we support education in the theater. Best known for creating the Tony Award, our work reaches beyond Broadway and New York. These seminar programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are an unequal form for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth interviews are heard on XM Satellite Radio. Our grant and scholarship programs support New York theater companies and theater students. And since we began, we have given away more than two and a half million dollars. Our theater intern group helps young people who are just starting in their careers build a professional network. And Springboard NYC is a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country. All of the American Theater Wing's educational and media programs are available for free, on demand, from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Now, let's return to the seminar. We spoke earlier about sort of who you're writing for, what your editors are looking for. I'm wondering whether you hear much from people about what you've written. We know newspapers certainly get letters to the editor all the time, but do, are there letters to the theater critics? Alyssa, do you hear from people? Um, I hear more about... I hear from publicists <laughs> a lot. <laughs> oh, we loved what you wrote, if I wrote something positive. Um, and occasionally, uh, because I'm also a reporter, I'll hear something from an artist. I'm always shocked when they know the byline, which I guess goes to prove that you know, not all people claim not to read their reviews. Um, but I get more feedback on pop music, I think, because um, I get some great feedback on, on theater, uh, but not not as much as, as pop music. It's, it's always but really smart. What do you hear? Is it simply, oh, we're really glad you liked that show, we loved it too, or, mm-hmm. or do you get you know, questions about why you felt a certain way? Not as much with theater necessarily, again, as, as music. Um, I'll get more, you know, every now and then a reader will just make a comment, will say, oh, and did you know this, by the way, or you should, you know, check out this play, check out this CD, nothing comes to mind. But, but interesting things like that, more so than complaints or compliments, I would say. Michael? Um, it varies. Not very. There's surprisingly little, but it crops up sometimes with a delayed reaction. You know, years later, you'll run into somebody at a party or a reception or something, and they'll say, "Oh, I remember your review of you were all wrong about that." <laughs> um, you, usually, what the funny part is that I usually get immediate complaining mail of some kind whenever I pan a large Broadway musical, although you would think people would know that the Village Voices stance towards large Broadway musicals (laughs) is skeptical. Um, But more often, and sometimes I will get get a response from people who are interested in the subject of a serious play I got, I got a lot of mail about both Copenhagen and democracy because of that, because the, the paper is read by people who have a political interest. Mm. Mm. Jeremy, in, again, in a relatively recent transition, have you heard from people since you've come to the magazine, and indeed have they even talked about <coughs> your voice in contrast to your predecessor's voice? My, my predecessor is John Simon. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wasn't trying to leave John's uh, name out right. of it. Uh, it, it would we have all to know. come in sooner or later. 
there are, uh, yeah, there are differences. I mean, um, John, there would be differences. Anyone trying to follow John would be different. He had such a singular combination of intelligence and, and style in the way he wrote and passion about the things that he liked and that he didn't like. Uh, that it's impossible to to fill those shoes. Um, but do you think the readers has the readership acknowledged that change to you? Have you heard? Not much to me. I don't know if they you know let my editors hear it or uh, you know one way or the other. Uh, you know when I got the job, lots of publicists in particular were very quick to say congratulations. Um, the, you know, publicists were... They're paid to be nice to you. Yeah, that's, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure that's why. Sometimes they um, even mean it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, but, uh, but no, there were, I, didn't, I didn't get a, a big sort of outpouring of, of response from, from the, you know, my new readers. Mm -hmm. And do emails flow into Entertainment Weekly? Because email addresses seem very common in the magazine. Yeah, I, once in a great while, but, but really I, I don't get too much feedback. Okay, so I've gone down the wrong road with this question, so let me try to salvage it, which is, how do you feel? You are writers, you're putting your opinion out there in a public forum. Is it rewarding to you to do that if you don't know the response that you're evoking from the people you're writing for? Mike, as you said, your, your stuff goes out so broadly, you never know who's seeing or indeed well, in what form. You do get I indirect uh, you know, reaction from chat rooms now. That's where I see sometimes, hmm. you know, especially if I so make Does everybody look in the chat rooms? Let's, I let's try I not do. to. I, I do. I'm okay. a masochist. I don't even know where to look. And, <laughs> and especially if you okay. make a mistake. I mean, hmm. they do keep you on your toes. If you misspell a name and your editor doesn't catch it, hmm. you'll have some snarky comment on um, uh -huh. some chat room saying, oh, they misspelled the name of so-and-so, this actor or the character they played. And you'll hear about it, which is, in a way, it's good, because now I triple and sometimes quadruple check names of actors mm. in, play, in the playbill. But you do hear from them. Mm. You know, which it's, it's, I think it's the new form of, of, of uh, uh, readership uh, policing. I mean, mm. they, the, the chat rooms, the people who read those chat rooms are very passionate, sometimes way too you know, overboard, but they do keep you on your toes. Well, since you, the, the internet's been mentioned a few times, mm -hmm. and since you bring up the chat rooms, there's certainly been a trend recently for that even reporters, journalists, critics, to some degree, either are reading the chat rooms, as you say you are, uh, there are even th more gossip theater columns than there, there used to be. Does what you write get driven by kind of what's out there in the public? Do you have to acknowledge when there's gossip about a performer who's missing a lot of performances or, you know, if you've heard about a troubled pre-production process? Does that inform the criticism? Well, what usually at the time you review a play, the performer hasn't missed a lot of performances. Performance. It's yeah. when it goes into a long run. It's right after yeah, you yes. write what you yeah. write. Yeah. So my task is done. I don't mm -hmm. have to deal with but that. But certainly you hear the rumors of people, you know, if there are people who've been let go during previews or an out-of-town tryout. Or but that was always the case, you know. Before the chat rooms, there were the gossip columns. And if a musical starts out in San Francisco or Los Angeles with one production team and one cast, and it comes into New York with half of the production team gone and half of the cast replaced, you're bound to have to say something about that. But, yeah. but does that change the purity of simply judging the experience that someone is going to have going to the theater? Should it inform that kind of discussion, that, that kind of review? I like to think not, I, especially something in my case. I have so few words that if I have a hundred words for a show, I'm not going to linger on about so and so got fired and so and so is supposedly sleeping with this person. And partly we can't. We have an excellent fact checking department and <laughs> lawyers who pour through everything. Yes. <laughs> but uh, but but also I I feel like. It's, it's my mission, the, what I've been charged with, anything in what we call the back of the book, DVD reviews, book reviews, CD reviews, movie reviews, theater reviews, is, uh, is service, service to the reader, to provide them with a service. And ultimately, I feel like my service is to tell someone if it's worth spending their hundred bucks on. So there's 
there's a lot that you really just have to kind of let not matter. Yeah. Ultimately, it, it, if I could go yep. back to this, um, it's not that, that your opinion is affected by this, but that you have to acknowledge the facts it comes in with are part of the reality of any production. How you evaluate the production is then another issue. You know, you're not going to give it a bad review because they replaced the lead. Mm -hmm. You're going to give it a bad review because you didn't enjoy the show. Which, and the point is you have to review the show you see, but it can't stop you. I th it's, it's part of a phenomenon with theater that isn't always the case in, in what I call the mechanical arts, you know, like movies and TV, that it's not self-contained. It's Because it's live, it's part of a continuum with the rest of life. This play has existed on stage before, if it's a classic or it existed the night before and it's going to exist the night after you see it and write about it. it. It might change, it might have other things attached to it, it might be related but to something else. You, you acknowledge the facts about a production and the gossip about a production the same way you acknowledge the history of a play. Well, yeah, nice. I, I agree with all that, but I also, because I have such limited <laughs> yeah, we, space. Yeah, we all have because, such limited space. And, and also because I think, um, you know, we have to be very careful not to be too inside New York, too inside theater. I have to kind of pick and choose what I acknowledge. If it's something like, for example, Maria Friedman uh, struggling with cancer and the woman in white and, you know, giving that, I thought, you know, unbelievable performance rising to the occasion like that. Uh, it's, uh, that's something I think that, that I decided in that particular case it was worth mentioning, um, that it was very relevant to the piece. Absolutely. It also It also depends on what you say, what angle you take when you have, often I'll have like 400, 500 words, and, and if I include a bit of gossip or something that I think is relevant, that I do sure. think are a, his, a part of the history of the show, then I'll be off on a tangent and I won't be able to say anything else. So I've got to pick and choose. And with something like that, for instance, I, I didn't review The Woman in White, uh, someone else did, but I was editing the piece, and the reviewer did not mention that, so I didn't feel the need to insert it. Do you know what I mean? So I think sometimes it, it's just different strokes for different folks. Oh, some yeah, people would yeah. choose to mention it, some people wouldn't. Well, the angle that I took, I mean, I could have taken a completely different angle, which probably would have been <laughs> less Criticism favorable would be to the piece. Criticism would boring if we all mentioned <laughs> yeah. the same thing all the time. Exactly. You know. Everybody's got a different perspective, and that's what makes it interesting reading different uh, writers, you can get completely different take. Well, okay, well there, there is, you bring me to, to a, a question I wanted to ask. You say reading different writers, you can get a different take. Do you all read each other, and by each other I mean the critical community, once, you, either in some cases, some of you, as you say, Melissa, sometimes you don't write for a couple of weeks. It may be very hard to avoid becoming aware of what the quote-unquote critical consensus might be, but are you aware of what your peers are writing. Jeremy? I, I certainly am. I mean, I, I try to read everything. Uh, and I, I, there's this convention, uh, we're not supposed to talk. At a, at a show or after a show, we're not supposed to talk about the show. Even though we've just spent two or three hours doing exactly the same thing, it's you know, taboo to talk about you know, our, our, our reactions to the show. But once it's in print, I, the way I see it, uh, my opinions are strongly held enough and obnoxious enough that they'll withstand someone else's <laughs> opinions on the same count. And the people that are going to read me have probably read at least one other review first. They've certainly read The Times. I assume that anyone who's, who's reading something I write in the magazine has already read Banner Charles in The Times and probably read a couple of other people as well. So I, I, I do think there's, there's a way in which one of the things that critics can do and ought to do is to get a conversation going or to continue a conversation about what's happening or not happening, what should be happening and, sh and, and isn't happening uh, in the theater. And it's easier to do that if you know what people are talking about. Mike, do you? Sure. Read? It's, it's fun to read other critics, yeah. I think. <laughs> and also, they may you know, find something that you've missed. Like Mr. Feingold, I, he's, it's part of my continuing education in <laughs> the theater to read him every week, because oh. there's always some erudite little piece of info that I can find that uh, somehow I missed, or he'll, some factoid that 
I, that, that totally escaped me that, you know, I, that I find in other reviews. This is so embarrassing because I read him, not every day, but um, frequently, to learn how to be concise and get rid of all the useless factoids. <laughs> <laughs> we complement each true. other here, maybe. <laughs> Have you had the occasion, upon reconsider looking at your own writing some period after you wrote it, have you ever wished you had the opportunity to go back and change something you wrote? You're yeah, shaking your heads. So. I, I amend it at least, but the great thing about writing on a regular basis is you have that ongoing kind of dialogue with the readers and with yourself, you know, you can reconsider something, you can say, um, I mean, I'm a big believer that it's very much the visceral impact of how something hits you and you shouldn't try. I've learned the hard way. You shouldn't try to second guess yourself or over intellectualize it too much. But, um, but yeah, I, I do, I do come back to things and, and, uh, sometimes after seeing the show again, or I'll read another review that will just bring up something that I hadn't thought about and I'll think about it more. So yeah, definitely. I'm not sure it's so much the opinion of, about the show. You know, the, the big things are what you experience at the time. You look back on it and you say, all right, I felt that way then. Now I've changed my view, but it's too late to fix that. But it's the little things it's in the way you write that you want to fix, where you say, I could have put more balance in that. I could have... Yeah. I could, I could tweak this if I ever collected my reviews in a book and nobody would know the difference and it would be a better review. Well, as you say when you put it in a book, so if well, years from now if, any, of you, any of you are going to have your collected works anthologized, can you think of, has there been an occasion where, you know, something where you go, yeah, if I get the chance, I'm going to say something different about that? Jeremy? Well, I think, like Michael said, there are always little things where I was too enthusiastic about something or I was too hard on something. Uh, the, the more troublesome uh, reviews looking back are the ones where I just took the wrong angle on something or was too fussy about something. Or, or uh, the, An example would be uh, Richard Greenberg's play Take Me Out, which I thought was extraordinary. I think is, is one of the, the best plays of the last few years. And when I wrote about it, I was at the New York Sun at that point. Uh, the review doesn't begin to capture uh, how enthusiastic I felt about that show. And if I had it to do over, I just would have cleared out a bunch of the little factoids that I had, you know, burdened that review with and just been a lot more positive throughout. But one of the advantages we have with a serious play, as a, often as opposed to a musical, is that it will move from an off-Broadway venue to Broadway, as Take Me Out did, and then you get a second chance. Yeah, I managed to blow it twice, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't, I don't agree with you, and I've read both your reviews. I, now I'm going to go like, look them up, right, because yeah. I want to read. But, but it goes back to something you said, um, which is, is it, uh, or, you know, is it easier to write about the, the shows that you don't like or the shows that you do. Yeah. Uh, I find it difficult to write about the shows that I really oh. like. I was going to ask you yeah. that. I yeah. think we all do. Yeah, yeah. 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 oh yeah. Especially when you feel like something is really important and something's yeah. going to endure and, and you just feel like... I get so frightened of myself when I get uh, that feeling. Sometimes I feel like I I've run I'm out of words. Like I've used all the adjectives yes. and I can't possibly discover any new adjectives, but it's hard also because we only have one viewing of something. Not that I'm saying I want to go see everything twice, but a lot of stuff benefits from a second viewing. If you're reviewing a CD, you can listen to it as many times as you want. True. Yeah. You can go back and read certain passages in a book. You can, and, and sometimes you, know, you have the script, the publicist will provide the script, and you can look stuff up, you can sort of go over it in your mind, but, but a lot of times you don't. That's and why, you have yeah. one sort of shot to capture it, and I feel like sometimes that's just inadequate. I, I want more time with it. Yeah, I, I find myself thinking that a lot too, but then I think to myself, okay, well this is the nature of theater. The people who are going to be seeing the show are likely going to be seeing it once. It isn't a CD people will listen to repeatedly. Um, so maybe that's just how I you know, manage to not be too hard on myself. You know, I think with theater, as much as any art, maybe more than any art form, it really is about the impact at the moment. You know, I mean, I, that's something I learn increasingly. It's, um, 
it's, it's really important not to, I keep saying this, but not to second guess yourself too much. But then you have productions like a Sweeney Todd, which we keep seeing a lot of, and I, yeah. every time well, I see it, I see something new that I've missed the last yeah. time. And I say, are you talking about a specific production of Sweeney uh, Todd or each, the worst? Each successive, each successive production yeah. of Sweeney. We've seen New York City Opera, we've seen Broadway, we've seen the new Broadway revival. The Kennedy Center. Center. The Kennedy yeah. Center version. <laughs> So um, and that's a show that every time I revisit it, I, no. I'm fearful that I won't give it uh, you know, enough weight or enough, I won't do justice to it. But this also brings up one of the big issues, which is differentiating the work, the, write, yes. the writing and the music from the physical production, the event that you see on the stage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the things actors add to or take away from. Um, a piece of material. And is that part of the learning that the more it, that indeed when you start seeing multiple productions of the same work does it does that what reveals to you where the difference is between the text and the production? Yeah. Where the first yes. time you see it can you can you tell what went right? Well, sure. I think it's I think it you it, if you you know if you've seen a half dozen plays and you see the you, it, different plays, I mean, you can see anything and, and begin to get a sense of what you like or don't like or what you mm -hmm. think is good or not good. I th certain, I think it's certainly the case that once you've seen a Midsummer Night's Dream for the twentieth time, you start to get a more sophisticated eye about you know what it takes to make the play work, or where the traps are, or you know what what directors keep falling into about it. But I think there's also a sense like I, I, I'm always happy to discover something for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to have a completely fresh take on something yeah. can, yeah. can um, be an advantage. I think that the hard, it's easy to see in seeing a play for the first time what went right. The hard part is figuring out who's to blame for what went wrong. Right. Where do you separate? Yeah. Is it the author, the director, the actor? And it's only after experience, after repeated viewings of somebody's work that you get to understand that. Now I want to connect a couple of things that were said earlier. Michael, you talked about the issue of differentiating, the differentiating theater from what you called the mechanical arts, by which I presume you mean a film, a, a recording, a book, which can be endlessly reproduced. Well, a book is not mechanical, but the, the but mechanical, in the, sense the, that it is, the non live it be, performing It can arts. be endlessly duplicated and the experience is fixed. Yes. Um, and of course, theater only lives as long as, or production only lives as long as people are coming to see it. You all have an impact on whether or not that work is going to get seen, and when it ends, it has ended, except for the basic text. Melissa, you made a comment about in the brief space that you have, you're telling people whether to spend their, if it's Broadway, hundred bucks to go see it. What do you feel your responsibility is? Are you there to tell people to go or not to go? Are you there to give them a sense of what the experience was so that they can make their own choice about it? And to what degree are you aware of, not individually but collectively, the power that the critics have over work that is being done? I know that's a very broad question, but I'm gonna throw it at Mike. Oh my gosh, all three parts. Um, yes, in I, order, please. In order, okay. Well, I think you have to be, you just have to be true to yourself. I mean, it, it's your reaction. I mean, you can't worry about everything else around it, all, all the hoopla. You have to give your, as uh, Ms. Gardner says, your own visceral opinion about a show. You have to start with that and then, and then, then just go from there. It, it's, it's, if you think about all these other things, it, you, you just, you'll sit in front of the computer and, and stare and stare and stare. And especially all of us, we have, there are more constraints in terms of word, you know, word count on a story. My editors keep saying shorter, shorter. Newsprint is getting more expensive. They want smaller, you know, shorter reviews, I should say. So you just, you just have to give your opinion. So, and, and then forget about everything else and, and, and take it from there. And now the rest of your question, I forgot it already. <laughs> well, it's okay, but just, you know, what is your responsibility? What, you know, do you have, 
as, as part of the art, the way I began the whole discussion, that you are part of the theater inextricably. Yeah. The people who make theater may not have chosen to put you in that process, but you are there, whether, we, whether it's, it's well, you, you liked just, or you not. Do you turn it into a consumer, uh, consumer guide saying, yeah. okay, yeah. thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, you should spend 110 25 to see spam a lot or whatever? Um, it, it becomes then you could start then it just becomes about the money rather than, than the play and it, and and it's I have to do I have to say editors do they are fascinated with ticket prices you know if I could if they, if I could put ticket prices in my reviews it, it's one thing that that certainly is it's guaranteed when you talk to people outside of New York they say oh gosh Broadway's so expensive it, you know, and I always try to to counter that by saying well look you can go on the internet you can you know buy tickets you know online you got all these discount codes people have to be a little savvier today than they used to to get discounts you don't have to pay you know huge amounts well of the products. average broadway ticket uh, yes. is about 66 67 dollars mm -hmm. even though the top price is 110 dollars of course and, yeah and i so guess i am aware of the price cuz most people you know, when they come to New York, I mean, th they love to complain about the price of theater tickets. So I, in a way, I guess, is it worth, you know, especially now, I, I, what I fear about is, is straight plays, I guess. Now, the price for a straight play is almost as much as a musical, yeah. um, which is hard. So I, I, I try to be more encouraging to plays. I don't know, especially a new straight play on Broadway, which is practically so a rare, rare creature. Yeah. I, I, outside of, you know, we have maybe one a year that makes it. So in, in a way, I, I don't know if I would cut them slack, but you, know, you, you have to, I don't want to say you give them, you know, give them a break, but you have to try, I try to understand what the author is trying to do in that piece. Yeah. I'm, I'm wary of the thumbs yeah. up, thumbs yes. down thing, even though I have to give star ratings, which is I in have ways to give as... And do you do them yeah. yourself? The you get to I do, absolutely. Okay. I get to, totally to say that. But I think, for me, I've always read critics to be entertained and informed as opposed to find out whether it's good or bad, because nothing is good or bad. It's, it's all subjective, and the reason that I read Frank Rich and Mr. Feingold. I'm sorry. It's all right. <laughs> Not to date you. You're no, it's all right. <laughs> but but no, I mean, I've been I dated just already. Want, you know, <laughs> it's because they're, they're wonderful writers and they know what they're talking about and, and it's, they're just fun to read and you learn something. Not, it's not a value judgment thing for me. But do you ever have the temptation, is a shorter way of asking my much longer question, um, do you ever take the opportunity to use your position as a bully pulpit for something you feel strongly about? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe not a, a show or a performer or something like that, per se, but I, I think we all do. I certainly have a couple of hobby horses that I just ride every chance I get. Every, mm -hmm. Any time a show remotely presents the opportunity, I do. I mean, that's what's, to me, that, that I find, that even, if I, even if I tried to do this sort of you'll love it, go see it, or you'll hate it, stay home. I don't think I could, I don't think I could, I don't think I could do it. The things that are most satisfying to me about criticism are the things that start from there and keep going. The, uh, uh, you know, um, the things that we don't get to write about at all, all the, the sorts of plays that never make it to New York. Um, the things about the theater itself, not a particular play or a particular performer um, that I, I wish were different. The theater system. Because I, I really believe in the repertory model. I got all my training in repertory theater, and I actually think it's a much more workable model for everybody than the commercial one production, make, long run, make as much money as you can system, which dries people out and, and makes everything stale. And, there's, and, I, and I think that the way that those issues play out in, in the reviews, that there's a way in which it's too passive, I think. If we were to just say, like, this is good, this is not good, something like that, because it makes us completely dependent on the producers and what they put before us. Uh, and I think if you get into a job like this, it's because you have some strongly held opinions about the theater and what it ought to do and ought not to do. So the sense that from time to time you can be an advocate and, and, and use the bully pulpit um, to, to, to argue back, essentially, um, it seems crucial, at least to the way I think about what I'm there to do. One thing about this, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. I know you're always that. Related to what Mike said about high ticket prices, is I try to draw people's attention to the shows downtown or, you know, in the off Broadway institutional theaters that are not so high priced, but may be worth more attention than 
the overpriced thing that's getting all the publicity because it's got a big star in it. Do you even police your own reviews to say, ooh, will they pull this out as a quote? Yeah. I, I don't write very quotable. I, I feel like I'm not... I don't mean to make yeah. light of it, but no, you no, write but short but enough that, that in some cases a big ad could run your whole review again. It, yeah, <laughs> and, and there have been a couple cases where, where they have. If something is, if we give something an A, they, they might pull the whole review or, or part of it. I, it's, it's funny, I personally, I, growing up, I think it was always, it seemed very glamorous to be quoted outside of theater. Like to see your name and say, and it's it's still it's it's kind of fun. I take a picture for my mother; she'll like it. But mm. but it's it's something that uh, I I always think that I'm just not. That's just not how I write. And it's not even when I'm thinking, oh, could they quote this? I, it's not even something I think about when when I write. In a sense, though, I do have to slap a thumbs up or a thumbs down on something. Like Elisa, she gives stars. I have to give a grade and. Essentially, it is going to be a thumbs up or a thumbs down, unless it's like a B minus or something, and then I guess it's kind of in the middle. <laughs> I, I don't know. You have but to almost be more careful about what uh, you write that it won't potentially get taken out of context. You know, if you yeah. write that there are, are glorious costumes, will they say glorious <laughs> right. for the whole show? That that doesn't often happen. Yeah, very rarely. But, no. Yeah. In the days of David Merrick, I think it happened more. But <laughs> but something. Mike said, you, you talk about, you think about like what people's intentions were. I think that's pretty important when you're reviewing something. Everything is not a, a supposed to be an educational, you know, spirit-altering experience. I, some shows are, are purely for kicks or laughs or just meant to be a total breezy evening. And, you know, a total breezy evening might be a B, and a, a you know educational heavy thing might be a B, but they're sort of very different. So I feel like it's important to let people know what what they're in for. I mean, just what I mean, what someone's intending. Sometimes it's hard, but but you pretty much know if something is supposed to make you think or not supposed to make you think, and that's important to bear in mind too. Mike, you reacted when I was talking about uh, the quotes, and I saw you. Uh, yeah, yeah you, uh, you, you can get taken out of context, and I have been, and my editors will call, and usually they'll, you know, they'll modify. But I think, uh, do, do people care about quote ads? I think it's, it's producers who care about quote ads, and I don't know if the general public really, I mean, they seem it looks nice on a marquee, I suppose, but I don't really take them seriously, because I figure they've all been sort of strung together. They pick a word here, a word there, and it, all of a sudden, it, it looks terrific. So, um, and a lot of them come from not, they don't come from critics. They come from columnists or... Personalities. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a radio ad for I, for, I forget which show, the two lead quotes are Rosie O'Donnell and Liza Minnelli, mm -hmm. neither of whom I believe to be a member of the drama critics <laughs> circle. They've applied. Last we checked. <laughs> yeah. In the remaining time that we have, the issue of the bully pulpit came up, and... In planning this, it was not about an opportunity for critics to come on and say more about what they don't like. But you are people who see an enormous amount of theater. What would you say? You certainly each see in excess of 100 shows a year, probably more than that. With the idea of the bully pulpit, so we understand more about you, can you each tell us, and Jeremy, I'm going to start with you, because you said you have things you really like to sure. hear. Sure. What are the things that most turn you on in theater? What are the things you would like to see more of? Who are the artists that you can get particularly excited about? So that when we read you, hear you, see you, we understand more about who you are. Well, I, there, I guess it's a little bit scattershot maybe, but I like, I find the playwrights I respond to the most are the playwrights who are uh, public-minded, for lack of a better phrase maybe, uh, Carol Churchill, Tony Kushner, some of Greenberg, uh, Chuck Mee, people like that who, that I, I'm glad that there are stories about dysfunctional families on stage and things like that, but what's most interesting to me are the, are the playwrights who are trying to grapple with the way that we're living now, and Carol Churchill, I think, is maybe one of the best around at that. Uh, I, uh, 
I love live music on stage. Sweeney Todd, the John Doyle's revival of Sweeney Todd, I think is amazing. I'm, I'm always struck by how satisfying it is to see actors playing instruments or incorporating music. That I, I do think the, the greatest failure in the theater right now is the inability to integrate what's happening in music to what we're doing in the theater, which is not necessarily to say that you know, everything ought to be some post-rent rock musical, but that there's a lot more energy and, uh, and diversity in, in music in the 21st century than there is in musical theater in the 21st century. And maybe those two things will never line up, but I would feel better about that if more of an effort were being made now. Um, and um, I think star casting is like crystal meth for New York theater and will be the death of us all. <laughs> And, and the last one is that I think uh, uh, the most satisfying nights I think I've had in the theater are the ones where I feel that I've been addressed as someone in the audience. Um, I, I love Chekhov and I love watching the world that he creates on stage, but I'm always more engaged when in, uh, for instance, a Shakespeare play or one of the ancient Greeks or Kushner's plays where someone is speaking across the footlights uh, at me. And, uh, and because that's an experience you know you can only get in the theater. Alyssa? Um, well, uh, it's very interesting what Jeremy said about uh, we need to explore more opportunities to incorporate music because one of my pet peeves, I don't know <laughs> if this is the time, but uh, is, is the jukebox musical because I feel like uh, very often they have these kind of faux populist storylines and that's kind of ironic to me because ultimately what they're doing is not encouraging new voices, not encouraging new musicians, not encouraging new uh, composers, new uh, librettists, um, and not giving actors, I think, enough material. And I think a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, as much as star casting, I think, and this is certainly related to star casting, uh, these rising production costs and the idea that people are coming in musical theater, which is my first love, most of all for spectacle or camp, those wonderful stories and songs that I grew up with that made me passionate about musical theater that led me to pop music, that led me to Elvis Costello and Prince, that led me to Ibsen and Shaw. Um, I don't see as much of that in contemporary musical theater and, and um, I'm most interested in, in the playwrights and the composers who engage, even if it's not an entirely successful effort from my point of view, uh, somebody like Adam Gettle or Martin McDonough is, you know, who, who tries to tell a story, who tries to make you think and feel, think and feel. Feeling is almost more important, I think. Thinking with their heart. I've always said my favorite artists think with their heart. I felt that way about August Wilson. Um, so anyway, I've rambled on long enough. <laughs> Melissa, what, oh, what, is, what, is, what most excites you when you go to the theater? This is really interesting. Um, just hearing other people's tastes. I. Ultimately, I, I think there's a, there's a part of me, just like anyone else, that just wants to be entertained to an extent. Mostly I want to feel like I haven't wasted three hours of my life. I, I just want something interesting, something moving, something I loved hearing. Um, it's, as far as personal tastes, uh, Donald Margulies is one of my favorite playwrights. Uh, Three Days of Rain is actually my favorite play in the world, Richard Greenberg's. And I saw it off-Broadway in 97, I saw it in London in 99 with Colin Firth. I saw it at the Oslo Theater in Sarasota, Florida, where I was the only person under 65 in the house, I swear, but I, I, it's, to me, just one of the most gorgeous things I've ever seen. Um, I like Conor McPherson a lot. Uh, Wendy Wasserstein, I, I identify with a lot of what she writes about, and a lot of Terrence McNally, <coughs> Diana Sun. I loved her play Stop Kiss, which was uh, 97, 99 maybe. Uh, but I, ultimately, I, I, just, I just don't, and, and there are very few things I can say where I walk out and think, oh God, that was a complete waste of everything. I, I just want to be engaged and enjoy something, and even if it's only for a night, or even if it doesn't stick with me years later, I, you know, that's what you save the playbills for, so you can go back and sort of remember. Michael? Um, I keep thinking, I'm hearing all these things everybody else is saying. 
the first thing that always comes to my mind is in order to have a present and know where you are, you have to have a past and know where you've been. And I put that together with the experience I've been having in the theater where we've had a huge run of what Jeremy calls dysfunctional family plays, where you walk out saying, this was a very disappointing script, but the acting was really wonderful. I think we have a pool of actors in America in general and in New York in specific right now that is incredible. And what I would really like to see more than anything in the world is companies, the bands of actors getting together, producing on a regular basis in alternating rep where you play two plays on alternate nights during the week while rehearsing a third and bring back into New York the great plays that used to be in common currency here, Ibsen and Shaw, mm -hmm. whom Alyssa keeps mentioning, and Brecht <laughs> and Strindberg and Büchner and everybody before them, including Shakespeare and the Greeks, whom we desperately need. I, with my other head, I've got a, a second job lately as literary advisor to Theater for a New Audience, and, uh, where, where I've had two translations produced. And one of the reasons I took the job when they offered it to me is that they're the most enterprising company I know in terms of repertory and because they believe in actors. And I'm now working as their dramaturg on All's Well That Ends Well with a, this wonderful company. I know this is going to date the tape, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> But we have other projects coming up that are incredibly exciting, including a back-to-back -back alternating rep production of The Merchant of Venice and Marlowe's Jew of Malta with Murray Abraham in the lead roles. Well, you have a unique opportunity yeah. in that you have an association with the theater to actually do the work yourself and not But what I'm describing is a theater yeah. that is doing the work, and it was right. doing this without my help before I came. There are many other theaters in New York that are starting up of the, the Pearl Theater, which is maintaining a permanent company, Jesse Berger's Red Bull Theater, which is starting to do very exciting work and has a, an incredible reading series of all those plays I want to see produced. Uh, I think it's, it's something that started to happen in the 60s with the resident theater movement, and it got sidetracked because of the resident theaters suddenly discovered there was money in bringing new plays to Broadway. Mm -hmm and everything got confused. But I think there's a new movement starting up again and the actors are making it and they, because they want to do these plays. And then there will be greater new plays. Mike, you're going to get um, the final word. What, 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 well, what, what, what excites me the most are uh, actors, I think, who make me laugh. I mean, I am in awe of a good comic. I think Nathan Lane is the comic genius of our time. He's, gonna, he's in the tradition of an Ed Wynn, an Olson and Johnson, a Bobby Clark, names that are kind of forgotten today. I hope Nathan isn't forgotten. I think he's done <laughs> enough movies that I think he'll be remembered. But if a performer can make me laugh unexpectedly, I will, you know, I will bend over backwards to, you know, to give them a good review. And it's and comedy is hard. I mean, you can, anybody can do Hamlet. It's Charlie's aunt, you know, that to do that really well, you know, is a difficult, difficult job. And I've seen replacements in shows where you see the first performer do the role and it's brilliant, it's really funny, then you go home and see the understudy do it. You know, same, mm. same show, different performer, and the laughs aren't there. And I, I don't know how they do it. It's this mysterious, mysterious process. Maybe that's what makes theater so great. They can get a laugh out of somebody and, and that's really special. That's something you can't teach anybody. I've, I've asked different actors about how do you, how do you tell a joke? And you hear all these kind of, you know, you know, theories and stuff. And but the really good ones, people like Alinda Lavin, who can tell a, an, an amazing actress and also a terrific comedian, says you can't teach it to someone. You just have the knack to do it, and it's it's special. And and I think it comes out best in the theater. I mean, because you have the person doing it right in front of you. And I don't know if it's timing or if it's. Uh, you know, their presence on stage, the way they, is their musicality to their voice, but it's, it's something special that you just can't replicate on TV or movies. And ultimately, the pursuit that you all have is something that 
evolves and you learn whether you can actually be taught your critical faculties. It's hard to say, but it evolves just like an actor's skill. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us today about what it is you all do. The American Theatre Wing seminars are brought to you from the CUNY Graduate Center in association with CUNY's Department of Continuing Education and Public Programs and, of course, the American Theatre Wing's longtime partners, CUNY TV. Please join me in thanking our panels, and we'll see you at the CUNY. <laughs>